Hello, beautiful people! Oh, I don't know if it was a mistake to try to do all of these in one day. Um, but I'm also kind of enjoying it. So sorry if I'm getting more, like, delirious or snarky or something. Uh, I have had dinner, so that's good. Uh, I'm Byron. We're going to be talking more about uh, LGBTQ Bible things. Um, this is kind of just an overview at a relatively advanced level. I'm trying to say, like, everything that I think is relevant to each topic as I go along. Um, I'm sure there's some intertextual things that I'm missing already so far, and maybe something that I'm repeating. Um, this is part five. Uh, we're talking about the last two Pauline, uh, clobber passages, um, and that is 1 Corinthians 6.9 and 1 Timothy 1.10. Uh, so here we go. Um... So, uh, context. I always like context. I'm just going to read the whole chapter. Um, I'm actually going to go back just a little bit to chapter... Sorry. Um, chapter 5. Um, okay, so this is interesting. Uh, chapter 5 is this... Paul is talking about this guy who has been living with his father's wife. So that's a Leviticus reference, um, even if just situationally, uh, that wouldn't have escaped Paul. Um, now, Paul is like, you y'all are proud of yourselves? Like, a couple options. Either, like, they are also Corinth is a cuckoo banana city. Um, Corinth is, like, if we, if we thought Rome was bad, morally speaking, uh, Corinth is like, bleh. um, Corinth was a trading city, uh, by the coast, and you, you know how those coastal cities are, am I right? No, just kidding. Uh, it's just at the confluence of lots of cultures, so they had, like, extra gods and things, and just lots of different beliefs and stuff. Um, so they particular di particularly did some of this temple worship prostitution thing. Um, okay, so... Uh, the, Co Corinthians, for instance, is uh, one of the verses where Paul talks about like women having their head covered and stuff, um, uh, because uh, temple like prostitutes as uh, women uh, would have their heads shaved, and so when these uh, women, when Christians and the story of Christ and stuff like came around, people were like, "Oh, that! I want that! Like, that's good." Uh, Paul is actually much more egalitarian than uh, the culture around. As much as it, you know, might, by our standards, or at first glance, appear that Paul is not great for women. Um, uh, if understood correctly, actually, the, the Bible is the most, like, egalitarian book of its day. Um, so these bold women would be coming in to church, and God blesses that, um, these women have amazing spiritual gifts and they're they're preaching and whatever and this gets back to that idea of holiness and the appearance of holiness sinfulness and the appearance of sinfulness that uh paul one interpretation and i think it, this is the one that i subscribe to um is that this is a growing church in the same way that old testament was a growing people group um you know so what you do matters how you appear matters um uh, do, 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 do. So, uh, as a growing church, like, if people walked in, it, there's even some caution about, like, the way they talk about communion. Um, uh, if, if a newcomer walks into the church and sees what looks to him like a, like, foreign temple prostitute person worshiping God, um, or just, like, speaking at all, this person would immediately be like, nope, I'm out. Um, and so Paul, for the sake of... And is this good? No. In some ways, no. Uh, it did happen to work for the sake of the growth of the church at the time. In an accommodationist kind of way. Like, okay, we put up with the judgmental people for just a little while until people actually get time to know what we're about. Um, you know, so women don't, te don't speak in church uh, at this time, at the to this, you know, because of the stupid culture. Um, uh, um, 
you know, or like women keep your hair covered or whatever it is. Uh, so in a similar way, the appearance of stuff is important. So in First Corinthians 5, there's this guy who's been sleeping with his mother-in-law. Um, and the Corinthians are proud of it somehow. Maybe they're proud of it, um, like, in weird ways. Like, oh, look what we got. Um, but maybe they're proud of it of, like, look how tolerant we are. Um uh, and th this this whole narrative might come across a little oddly. Um, while I'm kind of uh, advocating tolerance, I'm not advocating tolerance of sin. I'm advocating that a certain type of thing isn't sin at all. Um, I don't think God really does tolerate sin. Um, you know, and also God is gracious and it's not our job, job to like tolerate or not tolerate or whatever. Um, Anyway, so, I mean, one interpretation is that these per people were like, aha, look how inclusive and tolerant we are um, by not laying down the truth. <sighs> and I recognize, like, you know, that's a, that's a tough place to stand. The issue is homosexuality is not a sin. That's the truth. So you're not being tolerant if you... Um, tolerance is still kind of a judgy thing. Um, yeah. So, I guess in this case, I'm kind of saying that, like, tolerance is not a good idea. Um, uh, but non-judgment is, is a good idea. Um, so, that's the, that's the context here. We we're already talking about, um, even, uh, okay, da -da 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 -da. Middle of five, uh, when I wrote in my letters to you not to associate with people living immoral lives, I was not meaning to include all the people in the world who are sexually immoral, any more than I mean to include all usurers and swindlers or idol worshippers. To do that, you would have to withdraw from the world altogether. What I wrote was that you should not associate with a brother Christian who is leading an immoral life, or is a usurer or idolater or slanderer or drunkard or is dishonest. You should not even eat a meal with people like that. It is not my business to pass judgment on the outside. Of those who are inside, you can surely be the judges. Uh, but for you on the outside, God is the judge. You must drive out this evildoer from among you. And that's a text from the Deut from Deuteronomy, uh, you, the you must drive out thing. Um, generally, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna do the whole excommunication thing. Um, if Paul wanted to, that's his business. Jesus decided not to, in general. So I'm going to side with Jesus on this one. Um, and I have no qualms doing that. Um, maybe there's some interpretive method that doesn't require that sidelining. But it, but Paul seems to put himself on the other side of the opinion as Jesus here. So that's weird, at very least. Um uh, the important thing here, to some extent, oh, I guess there's this inside-outside narrative. Um, we are meant as Christians to, like, call each other to account. Um, uh, that's, yeah, that's the beginning of what chapter 6 is about. Um, uh, how dare one of your members take up a complaint against another in the law courts of the unjust? So people are having squabbles, and instead of solving it themselves uh they're airing their dirty laundry to the rest of the society and because again remember the image um that's not great for the image of a growing church to you know be complaining about each other publicly and stuff um yeah and, and it goes against this biblical idea of unity and stuff um so if we have convictions we are supposed to call each other out uh now there is this thing that i call the privilege of the conservative um, I had a roommate once who had a conviction that, uh, swearing, cursing was, uh, was a bad thing. Uh, more power to him. Uh, there are Bible verses that kind of indicate that. And, you know, beyond that, just morally, there's like directions that kind of make that, uh, a believable kind of compelling view. Um, I prefer, you know, I certainly, uh, prefer not to use the lord's name in vain um the idea of god in general like if i'm not talking about actually god then i probably shouldn't be saying like 
God's name flippantly, or the idea of God even flippantly. Um, and the idea of cursing, like, to say it like a swear word, so to speak, like, I'm trying to say this without, like, cursing, I guess, um, uh, just because I want to keep this somewhat accessible. Um, uh, like, don't say stuff that's mean. Don't, like, put a curse on someone, whether it's, like, some funky spell thing or, like, saying, like, hey, like, screw you. Like, that's not nice. That's cursing someone. Um, so my, my friend, uh, my roommate, um, wasn't a fan of cursing. And there's this verse, I wish I could find it. Um, I think it's in Romans, but it's certainly, uh, Pauline. Um, and he says, if there's a brother who, or, a, you know, a person in Christ who has a conviction against eating meat sacrificed to idols, uh, it, Paul says all things are permissible, but not all things are good, Right. God is God. There's a Bo Burnham line comedian who I generally like think is kind of funny, but I'm, I'm not a huge fan of some of his more sacrilegious stuff. Although he's got good points. Um, uh, he's, he's singing a song um, and he says, uh, I'm the God of the universe. You think I'm going to draw the line at the deli aisle? Uh, indicating this idea of like, uh, beef is okay, but pork is bad. Um, you know, and I think God agrees with that sentiment as according to the the sheet coming down with all of the clean unclean all the clean animals don't don't call anything god made unclean um um uh <laughs> sorry so distractible um so this idea of God, Bo Burnham. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, so if, if a brother thinks that eating meat sacrificed to idols is bad, that, again, remember, that's one of the two things that, like, was the big rules. You know, circumcision, nothing. Meat sacrificed to idols, that's a big one. Like, sexual immorality and meat sacrifice to idols, and the, the meat sacrifice to idols eventually, like, wasn't important anymore. Um, and I'm not indicating a, d a direction of, like, oh, sexual immorality isn't important anymore. Now, I think that um, uh, sexual ethics is a huge thing that the church needs to do a much better job of, of talking about and dealing with. Because um, we live in a society that is you know, kind of like Rome, kind of like Corinth, uh, Corinth in its uh, kind of views about such things. Um... So, yeah, uh, um, don't trip him up, don't trip that brother up by eating meat in front of him. Maybe it's not even sacrifice to idols, maybe it's just eating meat in general. Um, if a brother thinks eating meat is bad, don't trip him up by eating meat. Um, if you have a conviction that something is a sin, then to do that thing for you would be a sin. Again, not because sin is this thing that is objectively like, this is a sin, this is not. I mean, there are some things that are that way, I think, but like... If you have a conviction against something, that that's important. Um, now, question all of those. Either. So anyway, the big thing is I didn't curse in front of my friend. Um, you know, but because of that verse and because of this privilege of the conservative, he could tell me, Byron, like, it's right there in the Bible. Like, I think you shouldn't curse. Like, I think you shouldn't swear. And not that I did, like, all the time, but I just don't, I don't really care as much about it i think you know certain words are just part of a language they're used for expression um don't use god's name in vain and don't like hurt people with your words that that's my rules um you know but he had a more dogmatic view he had a more conservative kind of view and this privilege of the conservative is this weird kind of unfortunate thing where the conservative person can call out the more liberal person and i don't mean like politically like the political connotations of this are really stupid and annoying um uh, but I, but the liberal person cannot call out the more conservative person if it's, if it's a matter of like moral morality, whatever stuff, you know, if I say like, oh, come on, man, like, like God doesn't give a bleep about swearing, um, that would be causing him to stumble and that would be bad. Um, so in a similar way, oh, we as Christians are like called called to um hold each other accountable and all of that stuff 
Um, so, like, I, I get it. Now, frankly, on the gay side of stuff, like, I told my grandpa about this once, that, like, that same... Uh, my, my my mom was, you know, while, I, while she was still trying to come to terms with some of this stuff, um, she was like, well, like, don't, don't, don't push someone too hard. Like, that's their conviction, and that's important, because I had just talked about this verse to her. And I was like, yeah, but I'm not going to make a non-affirming person gay by talking about gay stuff. Right? Like, maybe that could be the case for someone who's, like, closeted and, like, has non-affirming beliefs. Um... In which case, don't do that stuff. Like, but question it. Question everything, always. Um, you know, so, if we're all grown-ups and we're all talking to each other like equals, like, I will push back on conservative ideas, especially because um, many of them can be hurtful. Yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine about um, someone, uh, someone I know has very black and white views, and the issue with that is that as a conservative person, they're saying anything more liberal than them is completely like incorrect and wrong, which is a different thing than a more liberal person who sees you know the distinctions and the gray between them, or, or more, even more than that, the rainbow of colors between them. Um, uh, the conservative person is saying like you're completely wrong, uh, while the yeah, we'll closer, um, while the uh, more liberal person is simply just saying like you don't have it entirely correct or you don't have as much of it um, you're not seeing in color which is more beautiful um, so that's that's what I call like this the the privilege or the um, paradox of the conservative and that's what Christians are kind of stuck in that like I'm if if you're also especially because I think non-affirming stuff um, is damaging uh, Matthew Vines uses this phrase. I can't believe I haven't mentioned this yet. Matthew Vines talks about this biblical phrase, uh, a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. Um, and um, essentially kind of what he's saying is um, if you restrict people, if you have a, like a dogmatic um, traditionalist uh, non-affirming view of uh, queer stuff and you like impose that on people or like ex ex express that for anyone other than yourself the fruit of that is typically vastly negative um, my old church was trying to do this thing where they were trying to be like welcoming and not affirming and there were all, I mean it was a big church and there were only 10 gay people LGBTQ plus people that I knew who like were there um uh and 10 out of 10 said that if you're not affirming you can't be welcoming um and that goes back to intent versus impact you might feel like you're welcoming but like that's one of those things that like it doesn't matter what you feel like it matters what the impact is um especially with something like welcoming um so, yeah, like, internal judgment and stuff. Like, discernment and, um, harm, again. Like, being non-affirming is harmful. Um, mostly. Now, I'm not saying that, like, being disagreed with is an attack. You know, some people are like, oh, like, you, you think I'm oppressing you just because uh, I have a different opinion? No, by no means. But, but your, like, different opinion limits my ability to exist like my different opinion doesn't limit your ability to exist or the validity of like your love um so that's you know that's kind of an ep epistemological nightmare right like this internal and external like you have an opinion i have an experience i'm sorry you you think that like not affirming this is is bad or sorry you think that like uh, affirming this that like it's it's somehow maybe like accommodating sin or something what are the results of that what is the fruit that that bears um and 
either conversion therapy or just like the the general effect of limiting people from who I think they intrinsically are and who God created them to be, the results of that are depression and suicide, right? And that's bad fruit, if I ever saw it. And that's like a low bar. Just putting that out there. Good fruit. What happens if you allow people to just, and uh, you know, don't extrapolate this or don't, whatever. I'm not making a slippery slope argument. Um, everything should be assessed and analyzed in its own kind of way. Like, you want to talk about the sinfulness of premarital sex? Great. Let's do it. Not now. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's an important conversation, um, to assess on the understanding of, like, harm and harm reduction and things. Um, and this conversation often can get into this gaslighting type of thing of, like, oh, you don't know yourself. Like, you, um, uh, like, nothing is more deceptive than, you know, sinful flesh or human flesh or whatever. Um, you know, you, you're like a little child who just wants candy. Like, oh, these types of, like, gaslighting things are so harmful. Um, I won't fiddle with stuff. Um, so, anyway, talk, talking about, um, like, good fruit. If we let people express themselves um, within even, like, there's still boundaries and stuff. There's, you know, good Christian uh, ethics and boundaries and things, you know, but allow people to express their gender and their sexuality. Rates of suicide and depression drop, um, right? In, an, in a non-affirming environment, um, the rate of suicide for transgender people is pushing 50%, right? Just think about that for a second, that if there was a birthday party for one of my trans friends and like she invited all of her trans friends there should be twice as many people in that room as, uh, than there are that's unacceptable um yet with with affirming family or community that number drops to like four percent that's good fruit dropping that number right and dr christopher yuan um uh, author of uh, Holy Sexuality, which is such a bogus idea. Um, or at least it's just not biblical. Um, he, uh, he claims that this kind of, this idea is prosperity gospel, that it's just this health and wealth, like whatever makes you happy idea. And like, I'm sorry, but it's not, right? Th this like balance, you know, I've had friends who would be like, yeah, I, I would rather like not affirm a person, a transgender person. I'd rather not call them by their pronouns um, and like let them die. Uh, you know, and I've literally had a person say this to me, um, tell me that they would rather like let a person die and like not affirm their gender by calling them by their preferred pronouns. Um, th and and then, then like to jeopardize their immortal soul. And like, my goodness, that level of of sheer arrogance is, uh, and I'm like, I don't know. There's care there, but like, what the heck is the use of that care if this person is dead? Just think about it, right? We are eternal beings, like we will be with God, um eternally you know but that doesn't mean this body doesn't matter <sighs> okay Whew, okay we have an again there's so much here i love it uh okay so we are we are meant to like convict each other we are meant to yeah you know, we're, but we're not meant to shame each other um there's this distinction i heard someone talk about a long time ago uh being embarrassed means you have uh uh, that, that something, like, awkward happened. But you're fine. Um, uh, whatever. And then there's being guilty. Being guilty is you, you've done something wrong, but there's ways to fix it. Um, you still are fundamentally, you know, uh, good and stuff. And then there, there's one more, I don't know, wherever it is, but uh, there's then the last one is this idea of shame. 
So shame says you are something wrong, irredeemable. Um, you know, or maybe redeemable, but like you have to cut off your arm to do it or something. Um, that is why shame is a lie. Um, because shame undercuts the, it, it opposes the power of God uh, for salvation. So, I mean, I hope, uh, again, like, I hope I'm bringing all of this stuff back to Jesus all the time. There's plenty of it, like Jesus said, that I haven't been able to talk about um, yet, just because it's one it's one of the, just categorically speaking, it's one of the more intertextual things. Um, it's not one of the clogger passages, but it is one of the primary points at which, like, LGBTQ things are brought up. Um, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna start with chapter 6 here, 1 Corinthians. Uh, how dare one of your members take up a complaint against another in the law courts of the unjust instead of before the saints? As you know, it is the saints who are to judge the world. And if the world is not to be judged by you, or if the world is to be judged by you, how can you be unfit to judge trifling cases? Since we are also to judge angels, it follows that we can judge matters of everyday life. But why, But when you have had cases of that kind... The people you appointed to try them were not even respected in the church. Um, so that's an interesting commentary of, of, of a very specific thing that's happening in the Corinthian church. You should be ashamed. <sighs> Paul, why do you use that word? Um, so unnecessary. <laughs> like, you even wrote, like, God doesn't use shame. <sighs> uh, you should be ashamed. Is there really not one reliable man among you to settle difference? differences between brothers and so one brother brings a court case against another in front of unbelievers it's bad enough for you to have lawsuits and all against one another oughtn't you to let yourselves be wronged and let yourselves be cheated so that's an interesting kind of like turn the other cheek uh theology which jesus represents uh, a lot of um personally uh i don't think he represents it as represents a lot of it for other people um, I'm actually torn between this. Idea. Like, I'm very into social justice, and I think that it's heart, it's God's heart for the world. But Jesus doesn't technically do a lot of it um, in terms of action. He said he says a lot, and his actions uh, speak. Well, I mean, he he is very validating of like women and marginalized people in general. Um, but yeah, Jesus, frankly, isn't as social justice as I wanted him to be, which maybe, to me, is like a critique. Maybe social justice can be uh, an idol for me, um, and that I focus too much on that. Um, uh, to the exclusion of this, you know, other very important theological idea that Jesus presents of humility and, um, like, turn the other cheek theology. There's a document called the Didache, uh, which was essentially the teaching. So in Acts 2, when it says, and... Uh, all the people committed themselves to the teachings um, of the apostles or disciples or whatever. Um, that word there, the teachings, is the DDK. So that's a that's a book that we still have. Um, it's it frankly should kind of be a book of the Bible, um, and it says a lot of things that are like practical wisdom. It's kind of like a, a handbook for the early church, um, and y'all should read it. Um, it's not that hard uh, to find online and read. Um, anyway, it goes in a little bit more than I'm comfortable with, even, um, to this idea of, like, self-sacrifice, and, like, if someone steals something from you, don't even ask for it back. Um, and that really, like, goes against my own mentalities of justice. Um, but it seems to fit somewhat well with what Jesus understood or communicated justice to be, so. Anyway, Paul's saying some stuff here. Um... Oughtn't you rather to let yourselves be cheated, but you are doing the wronging and cheating to your own brothers. Ooh, condemnation. Um, conviction, right? Guilty, not shame. So uh, now we're dealing with 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Here we go. You know perfectly well that people who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God in general. Now, already, we're not saying people who have ever sinned uh, will not go to heaven. Um... We're talking about the idea of practicing sin, uh, of consistently, consciously doing this thing. This even this idea of, like, uh, drunkards. Like, that's not someone who's gotten drunk. Liars. That's not someone who, like, has lied. We've all kind of done that. Um, we're talking about people who make a, make a habit of it and know, right? Back to the Romans verse, like, people who know what's up and don't do it. 
Um, so part of it is intent. Uh, okay, so you know perfectly well that people who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God. People of immoral lives, idolaters, adulterers, catamites. Oh my gosh, my Bible is really old. Um, this this book was written in, this translation was in the 60s. Um, this may not be the best translation to read. Uh, whatever. Cat catamites is um, a word that kind of means, it's like sodomite. Uh, like no gay, no gay sex, but catamite is like no lesbian sex. I think that's my interpretation. Um, I may need to find another Bible. Um, oh, there's an NIV that I'm propping up my phone with. Uh, excuse me for a second while we earthquake. Oh! Okay. Uh, this is my mom's NIV, which is acceptable. Um, oh, wow. Who flipped right to it, friends? Woo Technically, I flipped to First Timothy chapter two, uh, which is not the right one. Um, oh, I got excited for nothing. But seriously, let's see if I can. Oh, First Corinthians twelve. So close. There we go. Second flip. Hmm. Ah, oh, I love it when that happens. Okay, I needed that like <laughs> respite, that break. Uh, sexual immorality. Nope. Here we go. Nine. Uh, do you not know that uh, wicked that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Um, do not be deceived. Neither sexually immoral nor neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters nor adulterers nor male prostitutes nor homosexual offenders nor thieves uh, nor the greedy nor drunkards nor slanderers nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Wow. Okay. That is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, interesting comment uh, earlier about Rome that I forgot. That it said, um, like, people who did all the, the gay things would be punished. Does that mean there shouldn't be any more gay people? Or does God keep, like, making gay people when they do bad things? Um, uh... I think it was my uncle who said, like, hey, this will keep being a problem as long as gay children keep being born in the church. Um, like, if this isn't an external, th this is a homeland security problem, <laughs> uh, so to speak. Okay, so my version, uh, or the uh, Jerusalem Bible says, um, uh, people of immoral lives, idolaters, adulterers, catamites, sodomites, thieves, usurers, drunkards, drunkards, slanderers, and swindlers will never inherit the kingdom of God. These are the sort of people some of you were once but now you have been washed clean and sanctified and justified through the name of jesus uh, the name of the lord jesus uh, and through the spirit of our god um okay so we know i mean through god all things are possible but we know that either god's not pulling up god's end of the bargain when people ask to not be gay anymore um, or they're not doing it. And I'm not a fan of victim blaming. I'm not a fan of blaming God for things. Um, so that sounds like it's just kind of a stupid question. Um, uh, so what does it mean, you know, if, if this understanding of, like, the immutability of homosexuality, which I kind of tend to, like, have some inclination toward, even though earlier I said, like, I'm a fan of the general, like, uh, fluidity of things. And, you know, within a macro sense, I think that's that's true, but in a micro sense, like, I, I don't see my friends changing their, uh, uh, orientations, <laughs> you know, willy-nilly, and I have hundreds of gay friends, queer friends. Um, okay, so what does it mean some of, uh, s these are the sort that some of you were? What does this one say? Um, uh, and this is what some of you were. That's weird. To me, that indicates that we're not talking about gay people. Uh, in at least these two verses. Um, sorry, my mom had some notes in her Bible and I wanted to know what they were. Um, okay, anyway, we're going to read this in Greek, uh, or at least two of the words that are important. Uh, and then we're going to interpret some other bits of this. So I'm going to, again, read it in IV. Uh, in this case, the one thing it's better for. Um, oh, okay, so... Uh, this is where that word sodomy comes in. No. Yes. Oh, it's so much to remember. Um, yes. Yes, it is. Sodomites. Um, so, uh, 
sodomy is the word that was used in this spot um as of some of like the the earliest english translations um interestingly enough it's not the the word that was used for um other languages translations um kin Knabenschneider or kinderschneider or something like that was used in german which means like boy molester um which of course has an entirely different connotation and you'll understand why in a second um it it wasn't until the revised standard version uh written in or translated uh by committee in 19 46 i think um it's not until they they put the word homosexuality in the bible homosexuals um back then i will remind you that like homosexuality as a, like as a mental like wasn't taken off of the mental disorder list until the 70s um uh yeah like the word homosexual was only invented in like 1860 okay um by like german psychologists um and again like uh, back back to this act action attraction distinction like it, it wasn't who someone was it was what someone did um uh so this this word here in the niv homosexual offenders um the rsv the first version uh use the word homosexuals and they actually combined the two words in greek arsenokoitai and malakoi or mal malakos and arsenokoitai um into one word malakoi means soft like it also means effeminate again back to like misogyny problems that run throughout the bible um and arsenokoitai is a word combination uh that paul probably in uh, that he definitely invented that he probably got and was inspired by from the greek septuagint version um of the leviticus passages uh which says a man shall not lie with another man so it's it like shall not uh it, it's like don't arsen no solo le koita is arsen something um so like man bed koita like coitus um like sex uh man bed is what that word means arsen um it kind of means like man better one who like beds men uh but the context again is this something that like is uh part of attractions and part of like consensual monogamous whatever um remember the context of this whole passage it, it's a little bit like sexual immorality and what what like we're tolerating and stuff um uh in chapter five um you know i i didn't want to be like dishonest and say like oh sexuality is like not relevant until this point no like it's relevant um chapter seven goes on to talk about marriage the rest of chapter six talks more about like fornication and you know things like that um in fact i'll, I'll go on and read that in my uh jerusalem translation once we're once we're done talking about a little bit of this arsenokoitai stuff um so the rsv translated uh both of those words and like if you just combine words are you sure you know what it means like the word butterfly is technically made of the word butter and fly, and it has nothing to do with either of those. Um, I mean, flying, I guess. But, um, so, like, the word is used once in the Bible. Which one is used in First Timothy? Uh, yeah, okay, it's used twice in the Bible, and then, like, really no... It, and, and it's the Bible where it was first used. Um, it... it doesn't appear very often elsewhere it's not in like greek mythology or anything as a as a greek word um it appears elsewhere as actually in the list of economic exploitation sins um or economic sins you'd think it appear in like a sexual sin category uh but there's an interesting thing there so anyway uh there was a wonderful old canadian gay canadian pastor who like read the rsv and was like wait 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 wait, wait, wait. there's a problem you combined this like these two greek words into this one weird english word that like has only been around for 80 years and like has changed a lot even in that time like this is po this is like world war during the world wars like being gay like again like remember buggery laws and the history behind all of this stuff like the the idea of being gay has changed so much just in the last 20 years and then the 20 years before that 
and in the 20 years before that and going back like when a bunch of white cis straight men put that word in the bible they had not a freaking clue what they were doing um again kathy baldock has written a whole book about this um they didn't mean it maliciously they just kind of slipped in because why should a bunch of straight white cis men um there was actually a couple women there too sorry um uh why should they like know anything about this uh during the 40s <laughs> so anyway um so there's this canadian gay pastor guy um and uh he writes to the rsv committee very persistently and suggests a couple suggests a couple of alternatives and very good ones i don't remember exactly what they were uh but it was the idea in general of like sexual morality in general because to to imply homosexuality especially during the 40s was to like just say and it, it's a mistake i've already made a ton of times in this conversation right to say like oh like homosexual sex no i'm sorry today homosexual sex means sex that is motivated by same-sex attraction right what they kind of meant was same-sex sex and that's what they should have said and actually more than that it's not just same-sex sex it's same-sex rape um which again is like the same thing it's the same commentary that was happening you know this is a common thing like um we again like thank goodness culture has changed a lot but like we we play pirate uh movies and and you know kids play pirates and stuff but like you got a bunch of men on a boat like what do you think the cabin boys are for like there's documented history so there's a fun it's again not fun um story a friend of mine i'm trying to remember if this was a story where this story comes from um i read once there was a there was a person a military guy who was visiting um afghanistan he was he was actually like serving in afghanistan and uh he went out to a bunch of like warring horse lord like people for a while and they were ally they were allies to fight um some other people um and these like men brought these young boys like these teenage boys with them um and the americans were like oh cool like are these your sons um and they're like no these are the boys that we have sex with and the the army people were like oh like this is the freaking like middle east you guys are you guys are gay and they're like what no <laughs> like they didn't consider sex with a boy to be gay because the boy doesn't have the like power stance to be considered a man and so therefore for the thing that you do to be considered gay because the you know these guys are like homosexuality is not um oh accepted at all um in that culture um so i mean this this idea has been around for millennia and still exists in many places that like sex with boys is this thing that just kind of happens um and it's not good again exploitation of of uh young people um power dynamics and all sorts of things like that um okay so he he suggested a term that like referenced that because arguably that's what this reference that's what paul is saying here um and i'll i'll walk you through why uh malikos has nothing to do with homosexuality or if it does um well again nothing to do with like homosexuality but um again it, it's like the the victim in like a prostitution situation or like a rape situation um although it does probably in imply the the male recipient of same-sex intercourse um and arsenokoitai's Ar arsenokoitai could um imply the active partner in uh that situation um but again there's a ton of reasons why that doesn't mean like homosexual love so anyway the revised standard version clarifies and makes it clear it, i think it, this idea of homosexual offenders um but even then like the afghani guys like they weren't gay right the ancient egyptian like marriage codes like these men weren't gay the um the greek uh pederast 
uh, teachers. Like, they weren't gay. The kids weren't gay. Like, everyone grows up and marries a woman because that's what you're expected to do. But, like, what is it, what that even means is, ugh, like, complicated. <sighs> okay. So that's some of the modern history of, like, how this word even got into the Bible in the first place. Obviously, the concept has been there. Um, you know, Romans and, and uh, Leviticus are pretty straight up uh, about it. Um, you know, man, man, sex. <laughs> and that's, that's again, where this word comes from. Um, okay, but it says... Okay, this one says, nor male prostitutes. Right? Like, so the NIV committee agreed that malakos means male prostitutes. And then it says, nor homosexual offenders. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, this note in the NIV says, um, Paul here identifies three kinds of sexually immoral persons. Adulterers, male prostitutes, and males who practice homosexuality. That actually doesn't agree with what they translated as. Homosexual offend... Well, uh, I guess if you if you are biased and you imply homosexuality to always be an actionable offense, or offense if actionable, uh, then I, I guess. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, so the NIV makes some unhelpful uh story. no other bible translation uh made that connection maybe another one would have eventually but it was the rsv first and it was something like 15 or more years before the nrsv um published its amendment to that by which time unfortunately the niv esv and like a couple other bibles had used the rsv as their standard translation standard thing to to translate again again most of this information i've learned from kathy baldock and her book walking the bridgeless canyon it's really good go get it um uh she hasn't no one has paid me to do any of this research uh if i did i who knows i wouldn't be recording this on my phone um <laughs> so i'm not sponsored or anything but um uh so that, that's just some of the modern history. And there, you know, there's no documentation to prove that the RSV committee was malicious or even aware of what they were doing. However, the ESV particularly and some of the other translation committees knew what they were doing, right? There are some times in the RSV where it's like brothers and sisters, where the where the um, other Bibles are just like brothers, right? The, the point, they, they are maliciously trying to make stuff exclusionary um, for no real reason. Um, it's kind of like the, there was an algorithm that went through a bunch of websites t or uh, articles or whatever to change the word gay to homosexual because the word homosexual is, is like less palatable. It, um, uh, like it's it, being more clinical. It, it's just not, it's, it's not as even as nice of a word. It's a word that sounds like it has 10 syllables in your mouth, um, when you say it as uh, one author put it. Um, uh, and their, uh, the algorithm, you know, was malicious, right? But then it got a hold of, a, of an article um, uh, that was talking about the Enola Gay, uh, the, the plane that dropped the bombs, um, during the um, atomic bombs during World War II, um, and it called it the Enola Homosexual. So, like, these, these malicious, like, there are malicious... Um, People, focus on the family. Again, another one of those things that, like, I'm sorry, you're not focused on the fam. Maybe you were, like, initially, but now you're just some raging homophobes. Um, and usually I don't use that word, right? Like, a systematic dislike or um, uh, opposition to homosexuality or transgender things is cis-heterosexism. Um, in the same way that, like, a system can be dispassionately racist, but it's still racist, um, you know. You don't think you're a, a homophobe, but maybe you are. Um, okay, so here's a little bit about Paul. That's some, like, modern history-ish. Let's talk about Paul again for a second. Oh, you're all wiggly. Um, so, again, Paul likes lists. Uh, so you know perfectly well that those who do wrong things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, again, uh, obviously, again, this doesn't mean anyone who's ever done anything wrong. Otherwise, no one would be saved. But we're not saved by what we do. We're saved by our faith in Jesus. Um, and thank God uh, for that too. Um, it's this idea of practicing sin. 
consistently, intentionally, um, which is also hard. Um, I mean, the concept of addiction gets in there uh, in a really difficult way, too. Um, And I think God has a lot of grace for people who are addicted to stuff. Um, Because that gets into this, like, Paul Paul even says, like, I know, um, uh, and it's kind of this, like, cop-out. Hamlet kind of does the same thing in at the end of the play where he's like, oh, like, Laertes, like, it wasn't Hamlet. Hamlet harmed you not. Like, I, I didn't. It wasn't me. Um, and Paul does the, Paul does this similar thing where he's like, uh, I do what I do not want to do. Um, and it's, it's not me, but, like, my sinful desires or something. Um, so, again, Paul, back to this idea of, like, desire itself is, is uh, sinful. Um, it's not just the action. Jesus and Paul are kind of on the same page about this one. So, okay, so uh, people of immoral lives, idolaters, uh, adulterers. So again, the concept of where we're talking about idolaters, adulterers. Um, there's there's a thing that I remember about like the categorizing categorization here. Um, that I'm trying to remember. Um, Do not be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves. Okay, so this is a... Um, uh, Paul is making... is Paul is going from the sexual to the economic. So uh, listen to how he's talking about... Um, about these categories. Um... Okay, idolaters. That one's a little out of the out of the pattern, um, but I mean the the Old Testament also talks about like prostituting yourself, um, uh, like idolatry as a form of spiritual prostitution. Um, so idolaters. That's arguably a, a sexual thing in this context. Um, adulterers, uh, male prostitutes. Malakos is this word here. Sorry, I haven't unpacked that one yet. Um, I'll get there. Uh, Malakos is uh, the victim of a sexually exploitive uh, act, probably. Um, uh, Male prostitutes. uh, Nor homosexual offenders. So, arsenokoites. Now, that one is starting to straddle uh, this, um, uh, this new direction that Paul is going in in terms of sexual sins to it, to economic sins. And actually, most of the time, arsenokoites is understood as an economic sin. Why? Because if we're talking male prostitutes, the ars, as malakos, the arsenokoites are the people who are the, the pimps or whatever. Like, they're the ones abusing, using these male prostitutes um, for idolatrous purposes, probably, or at very least for lustful purposes. Um, so now we're into economic things. Um homosexual offenders, uh, nor thieves, that's like an economic stealing thing, uh, greedy, that's again like hoarding economic, um, drunkards, that's, maybe there's a third category here, um, uh, drunkards, slanderers, nor swindlers, um, eh, I heard that argument once, Reading back on it without um, all the information, I guess I don't find it terribly compelling. Um, that like it that these words are like not connected uh, to sexual things. I think they they may as well be. Um, uh, see, I'm totally willing to admit while I'm like working on things. Um, okay, but then malakos. So arsenokoita is a word that Paul invented, right? Like I've already kind of said that it's hard to interpret a word that is like only used by one person in one context except for a couple other times where it's used after that but he doesn't ever define it um uh if even if it is defined in context of uh leviticus then we know the context of leviticus um that that's back to idolatry and stuff um you know, or even if it's defined in context of what people thought was gay, was like same sex stuff during that time, um, that, as Josephus put it, you know, came back to this like salty drunk um, 
like exciting sex because women are boring according to what josephus like said um yeah there's some like greek philosophers who have some really stupid things to say about women um stoicism has some interesting philosophy that like feeds into some of this about like the value of procreation and things um yeah so um so Mal malakoi so that's arsenal quote malakoi is a word that means like softies um or it also means effeminate. Again, that goes back to pointing out how the idea of men being soft or effeminate, um, uh, how that was seen as a bad thing. Um, back to this big old point that, like, um, to view this through a Roman lens, the issue would be treating a man like a woman because there's nothing more offensive you could there's nothing worse you could be than a woman um like to continue in that like direction of logic even if it's paul's logic is not great um and it's definitely just not what we're talking about in terms of like nothing of the context here is talking about like monogamous consensual mutual homosexual relationships um and in fact what it is critiquing I totally agree with like yeah let's not abuse sex workers um yeah and you know and even Paul is I think being a little judgy of sex workers at this point so moving on the end of uh first Corinthians 6 uh so here we go <laughs> for me there are no forbidden things but maybe not everything uh maybe but not everything is good um I agree that there are no forbidden things for me but I'm not going to let anything dominate me. Uh, food is only meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Yes, and God is going to do away with both of them. Uh, but the body is not meant for fornication. Um, if the Lord, it is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. Um, okay, but the body's not only for the Lord. Like this is one of the reasons why I think that Paul is ace um, is because the body is for sex too. Uh, good sex and like good sex in good contexts um uh and there is this like throughout the whole bible there is this kind of like tension between sex sex and holiness uh like even paul in chapter seven he talks a lot it's a it's a beautiful chapter to read actually um <laughs> the first verse of chapter seven is hilarious now for the questions to it about which you wrote yes it is good for a man not to touch a woman gay um just kidding so <laughs> um i have a very high view of marriage actually because of paul and because of uh queer things and because of my interpretation of jesus and what that means in the whole bride of christ image um but yeah the, the rest of the rest of the corinthians passage is talking about um fornication and how we use our bodies um and it presupposes like heterosexuality in this in this concept again um and it talks about your body as a temple like your body is the temple not like your body in a temple for worshiping idols and things um so again just the context in what corinth is as a city the context of what even the verse is a highly steeped in idolatry um highly steeped in concept of like language so like to translate uh either of these words as something connected to homosexuality is uh irresponsible um and just wrong um so moving on uh last verse we're going to talk about is first timothy so um first timothy 1 10 context here again i'll just read the whole chapter why not um, from Paul, Apostle, to Timothy, in Jesus, loves and grace and peace. Um, as I asked you when I was leaving for Macedonia, please stay at Ephesus to insist that certain people stop teaching strange doctrines and taking notice of myths and endless genealogies. Um, fascinating. Uh, 
<laughs> Fascinating. Um, these things are only... And there's there's a concept there of... Um, I've had people accuse me, uh, you know, of, of being distracted. Like, maybe it's not wrong, but it's, like, it's kind of just a rabbit hole. And that's the thing that people have told me before. Like, Byron, your, like, focus on all of this queer stuff is just a rabbit hole. Um, and I agree that it is very secondary to Christ. Um, uh, and very secondary to, like, the commandment to love one another in general and take care of the poor. Uh, my best friend, like, his big thing that he talks about a lot is, like economic justice and doing the thing that the bible says mostly uh to take care of the widows and orphans and the poor people um uh so that's like hugely important i don't think that talking about queer justice and like serving the margins is anything that resembles a distraction from the work of jesus my old church said the same thing and it's just like no this is the work of jesus uh and like somebody has got to do it um you know that's just like a weird lazy stuff because they just don't agree with it um which like that's fine plenty of religious leaders of the day didn't agree with what jesus did uh okay so people being distracted by stuff like okay that's what jesus is talking about i'm very distractible uh, these things are only likely to raise irrelevant doubt <laughs> instead of uh, furthering the designs of God, which are revealed in faith. The only purpose of this instruction is that there should be love coming out of a pure heart. It's really what I'm talking about. Uh, a clear conscience and sincere faith. I have a very clear conscience and very sincere faith. Uh, there are some people who have gone off the straight course. <laughs> oh, language. Uh, and taken a road that leads to empty speculation. Uh, they claim to be doctors of the law, but they understand neither the arguments they are using nor the opinions they are upholding. So, to be fair, I will freely say that, like, you could accuse me of doing these things. Uh, you could also accuse people who, uh, who spend so much time and effort opposing just inclusivity and love of doing the same thing. Um frankly like it, it's one of those um catch-22s uh like kind of if, if you accuse someone of being defensive um like maybe they are defensive maybe they're not but as soon as you say it like they have no they have no way out um it's like i'm not being defensive oh you're being defensive by saying you're not being defensive um it, it's a it's a tough thing so even this idea of like accusing people of having strong feelings about like love and justice like jesus has those things too but but i fully admit like i'm always super aware and i feel very convicted every time someone's like is this really what you need to be talking about and like trust me i wish i could be talking about other stuff too um but until this work is done someone's got to be doing it you know you could you could levy the same argument about people who are fighting um uh for the abolition of slavery Right. Oh, is that really, like, the core work of the gospel? No, it's not the core work of the gospel, necessarily. Um, but it certainly is not a distraction. Like, ¿por qué no los dos? Okay, so, uh, we know, of course, that the law is good, but only provided it is treated like any law, in the understanding that laws are not framed for people who are good. On the contrary, they are for criminals and revolutionaries, for the irreligious and wicked. Like I said earlier, laws are for babies. Rules are for babies. Uh, for, for the sacrilegious and irreverent, they are for people who kill their fathers and mothers and for murderers. Oh boy. For those who are immoral with women or with boys or with men. For liars, for perjurers, and for everything else that is contrary to sound teaching that goes on within the good news. Um... Okay, so this one has a relatively good translation of what's happening. First uh, Peter, Revelation, First Timothy, First Timothy. So what does this one say? Um, for adulterers, for perverts, for slave traders, for liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to good sound doctrine. So the NIV doesn't even say anything about uh, homosexuality in this one, um, and neither does my. Um, 
who immoral with women, m boys, or men. So that's not super clear. But anyway, some people connect a, a, a verse here. And it does use the word ars no coites, uh, whatever. So, uh, so immoral with women, that's pornois. That's general, like, fornication. Um, adulterers, yeah, pornois. Ars no coitai, uh, NIV translates it as perverts. Um, again, we've already translated it as, uh, like, people who um, are uh, users of, like, male prostitution. Um, this, this is the other one. This, again, oh, back to, like, German, Knabenschneider or uh, Kinderschneider or whatever it is. Uh, Kinderknaben or whatever it is. I don't speak German, sorry. Um, my Bible, Jerusalem Bible, says uh, immoral with boys. So that's that's like boy molester, um, which of course is bad. I agree that it's bad. Um, uh, or with men for slave traders. So andropodistas. So it, you know, it says immoral with women in the form of like adultery, immoral with boys in the form of like sexual exploitation, um, and then immoral with men in the form of slave trading or kidnapping. Like, these are, you know, so my translation is not the most helpful here. Um, actually, uh, the NIV, again, is better for these two verses. For adulterers, perverts, or slave traders. That's pretty accurate um, to what the original Greek, whatever it says. Um, and then it says, for liars, for perjurers, for everything else that is contrary to sound doctrine or teaching. Um, that goes with the good news of the glory of the blessed God of the gospel that was entrusted to me. Uh, Paul on his own calling, um, uh, I don't know, what else does this say? Um, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, who has judged me faithful enough to call me into his service, even though I used to be a blasphemer and did all I could to injure and discredit the faith. Mercy, however, was shown to me. So, anyway, just the rest, uh, Pauline kind of doctrine and stuff. Um, wow. So... Those are the clobber passages. If anyone still thinks any of those have something to do with, like, homosexuality inherently, uh, like, I don't... Do you know me? Like, <laughs> do you know any gay people? Um... Right, like this. This isn't just a, just a. You know, again, epistemologically, this. What's your opinion? What is a person's experience? And I'm not putting my experience above the Bible, but was it Bishop Yvette Flunder who says, like, I am a living epistle. Um. Yeah, and back to the idea of good fruit. Like, what good fruit does non-affirmation bear? like, keeping to what God says, but you only, like, yeah, there's years of tradition that, like, hold that up, but not as many as, not as many as you think, like, as I said, the, the, like, word sodomy didn't always mean what we think it means nowadays, um, the word homosexuality wasn't in the Bible until the 40s, like, the, the church, there, in the 20s or so, there were particularly Episcopal churches, um, and but other churches as well that were starting this process of like in, of entering into and un understanding like homosexuality uh, as a form of like minority justice, um, which it now has become more of because the church decided to take the wrong stance um, for reasons that are like you know clearly tied to patriarchy and um power and privilege and things that are just kind of are unnecessary um is there anything else in the final like interpretation and some of that um there's a lot more there but though that's what the bible like explicitly says and none of those to me like a a smart person a smart like non-affirming person will actually you know make their arguments based on genesis um and something related to what jesus says in uh, mark 9 and matthew 19 um i think mark no maybe mark 10 um about like divorce and stuff but like 
that uh, I can dissect all of that too. Um, uh, yeah, like if you are strongly opposed to like homosexuality. Oh, I haven't even. Oh, like I haven't even talked about trans stuff. Like none of these verses. There's no verses in the Bible at all that like are strongly that are ever really like used um to support this non-affirmation of transgender identity or anything like other lgbtq plus uh identities um you know so like non-affirmation like non-affirming theology stands on such shaky legs um and I am flabbergasted and and so saddened by the fact that it took us so long to figure that out. Um, because interpretation of scripture, writing of scripture, for some reason has so often been done by the ones in power. Um, cis, het, men, uh, of whatever race is um, powerful or like primary at the time. Um, often, like, even rich people, and, like, how? Have you not read James? Like, the book of James is, like, don't you know rich people cause all your problems? Um, like, anyway. So, that's just some of the, like, bible -y things on this. Um, I'll continue, maybe tomorrow, because it's late now. Um, I'll continue, and we'll talk about, um the the bible things that talk about uh eunuchs um and transgender people arguably um i may also talk about some of the other um potential textual textual references um so now now we're going to like intertextual things um i'll talk about like gender non-conforming characters figures in the bible um at some point, it'll be important to go through uh, what Jesus says about, like, marriage and, and gender and things like that. Um, and then what, like, Jesus is referencing, which is Genesis. Um, and then what kind of culminates this all together, um, or at least brings this all to an end, which is Revelation. Um, and then even then, there's so much to talk about in terms of just general theology. General theology? Um and understanding of stuff that's even, you know, beyond what the Bible talks about. Because um, there's so much that the Bible doesn't talk about. And there's so much that, like, we need to learn by listening to our LGBTQ plus neighbors um, that we haven't done. So there's so much more work to do. Uh, I will be there with you for all of it, I hope. Um, I'll see you in the next couple sections. Uh, yeah. Take care. Love you.